the contemporary city is profoundly menaced. Not by any outside danger, but by an evil shaping within itself. This is the evil of the machine. Because of the confusion of its different functions, its growing mechanization, the omnipresence and anarchy of the motor car, the city is at the mercy of industrial machines. If it is to be saved, its structure must change. And this change is inevitable, whether it comes through insight or catastrophe. The city must be changed, or it will perish, and our civilization with it. Siegfried Gideon. All through the 20s giddy upward rise, New Yorkers had been pursuing another kind of dream. Not only upward, but out, into the expanse of green and blue, that, as F. Scott Fitzgerald had seen, alone was limitless. Propelled by the rising prosperity and restlessness of New Yorkers, and by the revolutionary invention that, since the turn of the century, had become the shining emblem of both, this fateful movement beyond the boundaries of greater New York would alter forever the relation of the city and the country and challenge all previous assumptions about urban life. The car disaggregates, the car uh, unravels tight, closely knit, interdependent urban regions because it makes place less relevant. With a car, it doesn't matter where some place is. So this relatively static, this relatively rigid, grid of streets and buildings and railroad tracks has to somehow respond to this thing which is hungry and demanding, forces changes on the landscape. So the car takes pride of place among the variables that are going to place demands on the city. The car is the whole story. In the decades to come, as the city moved through depression, world war, and beyond. New York would become the arena of a titanic contest between the automobile and the pedestrian, between the highway and the city block, between the compact, if often congested, urban neighborhood and the sprawling, if often anonymous, commuter suburb. Before it was over, that contest would all but tear the city apart and force New Yorkers to confront the most elemental urban questions of all. What is a city? What makes cities work? Why should there be cities at all? city as complex as New York. No city that builds itself and rebuilds itself so often and often so well has a high point, has a magic moment. New York is a constellation of magic moments. What is astonishing about New York is how many of the magic moments of the past have managed to survive. We have lost a lot but we've saved an awful lot. What are the magic moments of the 19th century? The optimism of the city hall. Sophisticated French-inspired building. Uh, what is another optimism? The Brooklyn Bridge, it's still there. What a leap the Brooklyn Bridge was. What a leap the commissioner's plan was, and it's still intact, pretty much. What a vision Central Park was. And it's there, it's more beautiful now than it's been perhaps since the time of Olmsted. Add to that 
these incredible office buildings that were built, which concluded with some kind of visible symbol at the top. So I don't think we should think of New York as being a closed book. I mean, New York could be said to be like one of those incredible things you see in a 4th of July fireworks that just goes boom, 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 and it keeps going. And we don't know how many layers of that explosion will happen before it all peters out. And we, of course, hope that it will never peter out. New York is that explosion. By the autumn of 1929, as the most spectacular decade in the history of the city came to a breathtaking close, New York seemed to have arrived at the very zenith of its dazzling career. In 300 years, it had grown from a tiny trading post on the far edge of the known world to become the undisputed cultural and economic capital of the world. Gathering in money and people from around the globe, it had made itself one of the wealthiest and most densely populated places on Earth. Its population rising from fewer than 5,000 in 1776 to nearly 7 million a century and a half later. Consecrated as no place on Earth to the power of commerce and money and unbeholden to any outside force, it had made itself the supreme center of American life. Then, in one last glorious decade, from 1919 to 1929, finished bringing into existence a ravishing dream city on the island of Manhattan, which had become the most modern place on Earth. One is stunned at the sight of these upright masses, buildings 50 stories high, straight lines everywhere, affirming the will to make room for millions. This is not an architecture for men. It is an architecture for human masses. One cannot understand it without first having enjoyed the thrill of adding enormous totals and of living in a gigantic, compact, and brilliant world. In the end, the fever pitch of the 1920s acknowledging no limits and building higher and higher, could never have been sustained. As if, like Icarus, the city had flown too close to the sun and then come tumbling back to Earth again. In the years following the crash of 1929, as the greatest depression in American history plunged the city and nation into economic gloom, two things would become fatefully clear. The city itself, acting on its own, could no longer meet the needs of its own people. And unfettered capitalism in New York, in a century and a half of relentless commercial growth, had been carried to its very limit. In the years to come, as the greatest domestic crisis of the 20th century swept across the city and the nation, New Yorkers would be forced to reinvent their city once again, on a massive scale moving as they did into uncharted waters, from which there would be no return. Between 1929 and 1945, as immense new forces were unleashed in New York, altering forever the relation of the city and the country, two of the most remarkable New Yorkers of all time would come to the fore, Fiorello LaGuardia and Robert Moses, and attempt to create in the darkest of times a bold new city of the future. It's strange to think how these two powerful figures, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia and Robert Moses, uh, interacted. I mean, physically so different. Uh, LaGuardia 
celebrating difference, uh, loving the tumble and the tide of the city, Robert Moses trying to bring order to it. But in some ways, uh, they were able to work together. And I think you can't help but look at New York in the 1930s and marvel at the things that were built during the Great Depression. The new parks and playgrounds, the swimming pools, the roads, the beaches. It was a time of achievement, a greater period of achievement than what we have seen at the end of the 20th century when we were so much more affluent and the economy's booming. New cities have always replaced old cities by periods. But today, it is possible for the city of modern times, the happy city, the radiant city, to be born. Le Corbusier. had immensely increased the range of our dreams for ourselves in the 20s. And that was why the Great Depression was a terrible psychological shock to people. It, it led to what amounted to an almost to a clinical depression on, on the part of the American people. They could not believe that we had stumbled and fallen. There had been downturns before, boom times that went bust, followed by years of hardship, want, and misery. But there had never been anything like the Great Depression of the 1930s. On the eve of the crash, fewer than two million people were unemployed in the United States. Less than two years later, the number had risen to more than eight million. And a year after that, to 13 million, nearly a third of the nation's workforce. Nowhere in the country were the effects more visible or more heartbreaking than in New York. Where by 1931, the greatest economic engine on earth had all but ground to a halt. What's fascinating is that the bottom doesn't drop out suddenly. The crash leads to a slow toppling effect. You know, they, they don't have a sense that the world has transformed and that things have changed irrevocably. But slowly it takes hold. Obviously, one of the first things that gets hit is the financial sector. And then the ripple effect in terms of business services spreads out from that. The manufacturing sector is hit extremely hard. Huge numbers of people are either laid off in the garment business or, in fact, their wages are cut in half. And industry after industry, from garment manufacturing to construction, kind of implode. And in some cases, really almost totally cease economic activity. And you have to remember, this is before unemployment insurance, before any systematic uh, government relief system. Uh, and yet, it's already past the era when people could go back to the land. Certainly in New York City, very few people had organic relationships with you know, land. Uh, the consequences are as they always are, that money isn't coming in, people can't make the rent, there are massive evictions. People begin to sort of crop up in encampments, in parks on the river's edge, in old auto dumps around town. Red lines begin to form. December 24th, 1931. Every day, one sees the degrading misery of bread lines. Every day, one is told that this great industry and that from railroads to publishing, is collapsing. The building slump spreads. In New York, the most salient new structure, the magnificent Empire State, stands unlet and can only pay its taxes by collecting dollars from the sightseers who ascend to its eerie for the stupendous view. Stories of failing banks turned in motor cars, despairing suicides, are dinned into one's ears. 
Mary Agnes Hamilton. You turn a corner, and here is a surprising spectacle. A line of men, three or sometimes four abreast, a block long and wedged together, so tightly that no passerby can break through. Those at the head of this gray-black human snake will eat tonight. Those farther back probably won't. Bruce Bliven. One million six hundred thousand people in New York of the city's population of six million nine hundred thousand. One million six hundred thousand people were on relief rolls. That's mothers, fathers, and children. If you look down on Riverside Park, which we were talking about, that's where the city dumped its garbage. And there were huge mounds of garbage at 96 and 125th Street. And you would see scores, hundreds of women and children. Whenever the trucks would come and dump the garbage, the children and mothers would run to try and get some kind of food out of there. It was terrible in New York City. In the country, at least, you can usually find something to eat, but there were Hoovervilles in Central Park. In fact, my, the sheep that graze on the sheep meadow that had been donated by my great-great-great-grandfather named George Coggle, he'd given the sheep to Central Park in the 1860s, and the herd had stayed there till the 1934 when they were moved up state to the city's farm in the Catskills because um, the city was afraid that the people living in the Hoovervilles would look upon the sheep as lunch more than as a touch of the bucolic. By 1931, tens of thousands of New Yorkers had been evicted from their homes. Those that could doubled up with family and friends, but thousands more, unable to find any housing at all, sought what shelter they could find in one of the dismal shanty towns that had begun to spring up along the East River and the Hudson, and in Central Park, called Hoovervilles, in ironic tribute to the president. Well, we're here because we, there's no work to be found. We came down to the Hudson and seen that the lumber floating in the river, so we thought of building a shack. So we built one. So we are not a burden on the community. We have uh, no rent to pay, whatever. We haven't got no work. We can't get no work. We're looking for work. Can't get no work, but we will by Tuesday in the future. Month after month, as the economic situation continued to deteriorate, calls for government action grew louder. In Harlem and in the Bronx, where one in three workers in the garment industry had been laid off, thousands of protesters took to the streets. While across the city, rent strikes broke out, along with political demonstrations of every kind sometimes escalating into pitched battles with the police. The devastation was so broad and reached so high that had it just been a manufacturing crisis so that unskilled laborers were out of work, I'm not convinced that everyone would have noticed. But everyone saw in the Depression either someone they knew or the likelihood that someone they knew would end up there. It seemed very clearly out of people's own hands. And I think that did propel a kind of communal commitment the temporary bureaucracies of relief thrown up by the crisis have all the character of a frail expeditionary force sent into a war that is expected to last only three months and which has become instead a world war. Their theory is still essentially that of charitably helping bums and weaklings over the rough places rather than masses cut down by a kind of economic massacre, the New Republic. Under Herbert Hoover, federal authorities had all but washed their hands of responsibility for the growing number of destitute Americans. New York State itself, under Governor Franklin Roosevelt, had been among the first to respond with large-scale relief programs. But little of the money that passed through City Hall reached the people for whom it had been intended. 
as Tammany officials pocketed most of the funds, then made sure most of the rest was distributed to party regulars. New York then was a city utterly unable to meet the needs of its people in almost every respect. The Tammany machine was totally corrupt. Really shocking percentage of the relief dollars that came in to New York was siphoned off by the Tammany machine. In 1931 and 32 and 33, New York was a city paralyzed, and it seemed like a city where there was basically no hope of it ever meeting the needs of, you might say, the 20th century. The automobile age had arrived. The city was strangling on its traffic. It was unable to build a single mile of arterial highway. Uh, it had an idea of building what we now know as the Henry Hudson Bridge. They had been talking about it for 30 years. It wasn't built. The tri road Bridge had been started and stopped, and there was no hope of starting these things in any foreseeable future. For years, rumors of official malfeasance had swirled around City Hall, which, by 1931, had been occupied for more than half a decade by a dapper and charmingly corrupt ex-vaudeville performer and Tammany man named James J. Walker, under whose reign Tammany's system of patronage and spoils had spiraled completely out of control. Well, I'm sure I would have liked him. I mean, he must have been a marvelous person to spend time with. I mean, he was a dreadful mayor. He often didn't show up until noon and was usually gone by three in the afternoon. And he was a songwriter. He wrote, you know, you love me in December as you do in May. It was still a famous song. I think he fitted his times very well. Was he a good mayor? No, he was an awful mayor. He was as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Robert Moses had the perfect expression for Jimmy Walker. Half Bo Bremel, half gutter snipe. Moses would watch Walker walk into the office in the morning. You know, he wore a single button suit, perfect, the narrowest of cravats, spats, the little highly polished shoes. Robert Moses would see him come in the morning, there'd be a pile of mail on his desk, and he'd say, any checks in there? And if someone said no, he'd sweep them all off the desk. His mayoralty of the city of New York, you know, is sort of enshrined as legend as something with an overtone of fun. But it wasn't fun for the people of the city. The city was doing nothing to help its people in the depths of the Depression. It was doing remarkably little. The problem was that there was no money coming from the state and there was no money coming from the federal government. So he was left with no recourse really but to borrow. And he borrowed, and he borrowed, and he borrowed. And in fact, in the end, he basically had to agree that the city would, in fact, make tremendous cuts in public services, stop these public works programs, lay off workers, and the rest of it. And it was at this moment, really, that he ran into even more serious trouble, and the investigations of Walker begin that lead to his downfall. The beginning of the end of Walker's reign came in the fall of 1930, when Governor Franklin Roosevelt obliged to distance himself from Tammany Hall as he prepared his run for the presidency, appointed a fiercely upright, reform-minded judge named Samuel Seabury to investigate corruption in city government. And they begin to find, and it's not too hard, you know, massive amounts of official malfeasance and corruption, particularly in the police department and the judicial system. Uh, one of the nastiest things is that they're running at this vice racketeering where not only do they arrest prostitutes and then you know accept payoffs to let them off but increasingly they begin just arresting women off the street respectable middle-class women and you know threatening to sort of expose them unless they pay off it's really rampant running amok stuff and what Seabury does is he begins to sort of go up the chain of command getting closer and closer to Walker in the spring of 1932 Walker himself was called to testify on the morning of May 25th, the immensely popular mayor pushed his way through a throng of 5,000 admirers outside the county courthouse on Foley Square and strode confidently into the courtroom. Informed of Walker's rousing reception, Seabury said simply, they gave one to Boss Tweed, too. You know, Walker was so charming that when C Judge Samuel Seabury was having his investigation, he was 
He was advised by his aides, he's so charming, don't look him in the eye or he'll charm you. So when Seabury was cross-examining Jimmy Walker on the stand, he tried to stand sideways so that Walker couldn't catch his eye. Once on the witness stand, however, there was little Walker could do. As Seabury marshaled evidence of the nearly $1 million the mayor had pocketed in kickbacks, Money's Walker himself gamely tried to explain away as beneficences. By the end of the summer, it was clear to almost everyone that Walker had to go. And he abdicates. He leaves office. Seabury was not about to actually bring formal charges. He said, I got lots of circumstantial evidence, but I don't have that smoking gun. But it was Roosevelt behind the scenes that made sure uh, that Walker would, in fact, now take his much delayed exit. Franklin Roosevelt, governor of New York, gave him his choice of resigning or being fired. And he opted to resign, to be replaced by this nobody named Boo Boo O'Brien, um, who was famous for his first press conference. Somebody asked him who the new sewer commissioner was going to be, and Boo Boo O'Brien said, I don't know, they haven't told me yet. <laughs> you too will find out what criticism is. You, too, though, will find the same comfort in the midst of criticism that comes from an easy conscience and a knowledge within yourself that no matter whether misunderstood or not, you did the best you could. On September 1st, 1932, Jimmy Walker left City Hall for the last time, vowed to run again and clear his record then sailed for Europe to join his mistress, the actress Betty Compton, in Paris. That dazzling, theatrical, and essentially absurd career has collapsed at last. The New York Herald Tribune. The elimination of Mr. Walker as mayor of this city is a distinct victory for higher standards of public life. Judge Samuel Seabury. You didn't think I had any, did you? <laughs> More than anyone realized, the demise of Jimmy Walker and the devastating depression that triggered it had set the stage for one of the most far-reaching political transformations in American history. Before the year was out, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's deft handling of the Walker scandal had helped propel him to the White House. Give me your help not to win votes alone, but to win in this crusade to restore America to its own people. In New York, meanwhile, with Tammany on the retreat for the first time in 15 years, Reformers saw their chance of finally retaking City Hall, pinning their hopes on a brilliant young civil servant named Robert Moses, who under Al Smith had built the first state park system in the country and the first system of public highways in the world. The reform forces realize after Walker is out that Tammany is a wounded beast and that there's a possibility for actually winning power for a reform candidate. The question is, who's it going to be? The person that most of the reformers want is Robert Moses. But Samuel Seabury, who is, because of his role in the investigation, the kingmaker here, won't hear of it. Why? Because Moses is an Al Smith man. And Al Smith is a Tammany man. And Seabury is determined to keep Tammany out of City Hall. He wants Fiorello LaGuardia. He was, in many ways, the least likely of candidates. A short, excitable 51-year-old ex-congressman and failed mayoral candidate, widely thought to be finished in politics, having lost to Jimmy Walker only four years before in one of the biggest landslides in the city's history. Actually, the idea of LaGuardia horrifies most of the reformers. This guy had been the most radical congressman all through the 1920s, and then when the Depression came, he was railing furiously against Hoover, his own party administration, for not, in fact, helping the unemployed. 
And he was also attacking bankers, you know. Uh, those bastards broke the people's back with their usury. Let them die. The people will survive. Well, you know, the forces of reform were not exactly interested in this kind of rabble-rouser. But Seabury was adamant. He's absolutely honest, the judge declared. He's a man of great courage. And he can win. I shall be the mayor of the city of New York. Why did Seabury want him? Because, in fact, the guy was a scrapper, because the guy knew how to really go out and campaign. A lot of the good government types had never, you know, set foot in the streets. This guy could debate, you know, in Yiddish to get the Jewish vote. And, very important, he had a large, disaffected Italian constituency whom, in fact, had been kept out of access to power and jobs by the Irish Tammany machines. He was, in a way, reflective of New York City, a, a one-person melting pot. Mother's Jewish, father's Italian, he's an Episcopalian, speaks different languages, but a person who's comfortable with difference. A person who not only is comfortable with it, celebrates it. I think he's also the first made to embody in his style uh, a kind of multiculturalism that really embraces all New Yorkers, that says the greatness of the city is precisely in its heterogeneity, that this is its richness not in its august traditions, not in its great wealth. I think he was committed to the mess that was New York. It wasn't neat, it was uh, combative, and it was energizing, and it was complex. Uh, and I think he, that's what he was trying to get. It was allowing people to thrive in that kind of equal opportunity community and to try to build that kind of city. On election day, the largest turnout in the city's history, over two million voters propelled the fusion candidate into City Hall by the narrowest of margins. At 12.05 a.m. on the morning of January 1st, 1934, while the streets filled with thousands of New Yorkers celebrating the repeal of Prohibition, LaGuardia took the oath of office in the library of Samuel Seabury's townhouse on East 63rd Street. I do. Now we have a mayor in New York City. Thank you, Judge Seabury. It was perfect timing. He was precisely the mayor that New York City needed to get through the Depression and the World War. He was the mayor of New York City during the most difficult time ever to be mayor of New York City. When we talk about fiscal problems in New York City, we're talking about ranges of unemployment that go between 4 and 8%. He was talking about 50% unemployment, a city that was totally devastated. So he took over New York City in 1933, probably at the worst moment, worst point in the history of this city. Determined to change the course of city government, as no mayor before or since, he set right to work. Skipping up the steps of City Hall on his first day in office, he shook his fist at the 122-year-old building, roared out in Italian, E finite la cucagna, no more free lunch. Then quickly showed he meant every word he said. In a matter of weeks, LaGuardia had begun to dismantle the corrupt political machine that had run New York for generations, cutting thousands of positions traditionally reserved for Tammany Hall loyalists, and putting in its place a new system of scientific civil service based on expertise and merit. We intend to have a general house cleaning. Yes, we'll not only clean the streets of this city, but I'm going to clean every department of every grafting Tammany politician and appoint honest men and women in their places. And in fact, here he was brilliantly effective. He was going to be in office for 12 years, and during that time, he systematically starved Tammany of patronage. And this is an, a crucial moment because, in fact, it's the destruction of the Democratic Party machine uh, that was one of his biggest goals and those of his supporters. And, in fact, uh, it was successful in Manhattan. He was not without his limitations. Theatrical, autocratic, and violently short-tempered, he more than once had to be physically restrained from striking other city officials. If you were any dumber, he once screamed at a hapless stenographer, I'd make you a commissioner. But New Yorkers loved him anyway, in part because he threw himself into the job with reckless abandon, racing to fires in a motorcycle sidecar, accompanying the police on official raids, 
and once conducting the city orchestra at Carnegie Hall, where he insisted on receiving no special consideration from the musicians. Just treat me like Tuscanini, he said. He was everywhere. He was everywhere. And he was distinctive because he was so animated. And his qualities were uh, that he got things done and that he related. He shared himself and his soul and his heart and his emotions as well as his ability. He was not afraid to be a human being as a politician. He was a person of the people. And I have always believed that uh, if you want to really represent people, you got to act like a people. You can't just be something above that. And uh, I think LaGuardia understood that. It's hard to say that LaGuardia has a single unified vision for the city, but he's certainly got a series of goals. And uh, probably first and foremost are the very ones that he, that he ran on. One is war on crime. He declares an extremely public war on racketeers and gamblers in particular. And he loves going around and collecting slot machines, taking them out in the barge in the harbor, taking his axe, and, you know, chopping them and throwing them overboard. Or rounding up guns. And he's very, very conscious of media. And he's got the newsreels there, and he's got the radio there. He's a very public, symbolic, you know, uh, acting out clearly on a, on a stage. He races around in police cars. He appoints good, tough, honest cops, you know, like Valentine. The people who had been shunted aside under the Tammany regime are now running the show. We're giving them no quarter. But the man whom the newspapers called the Little Flower had even higher ambitions. Even as the city lay sunk in the depths of the worst depression in American history, he dreamed of transforming it into the most progressive and modern metropolis in the world, of rebuilding its tattered physical infrastructure, ruined by 15 years of looting and neglect, through a series of massive public programs and public works that would put tens of thousands of men and women back to work and rebuild the pride and self-respect of the city and its people. I shall not rest, he declared, until my native city is first, not only in population, but also in wholesome housing, not only in commerce, but also in public health, until it is not only out of debt, but abounding in happiness. But the fact is that when LaGuardia takes power, he is up against the wall and he's got extremely limited parameters. The uh, uh, consortium of bankers who had been loaning the city money are in essence saying, listen LaGuardia, we're gonna cut you off without a dime, we're gonna demand our money back unless you take a series of measures. And those measures are basically cut public services and concentrate on paying back uh, uh, what you owe the banks. Now, LaGuardia actually does carry some of this out, and we tend to forget this. There were mass layoffs of city workers and such not. That was part of him. He was, in fact, a business-oriented reformer. And yet, in very short order, LaGuardia is in a position to tell the bankers to take a hike. And not only does he uh, not continue to shrivel municipal government and public programs, but he presides over the greatest expansion uh, of government uh, programs and, this, uh, and public services uh, in the history of the city. The extraordinary revolution that would make that possible would issue from an unprecedented convergence of local and national forces. A unique alliance of personalities and events and represent in the end the greatest single sea change in American government since the early days of the Republic. It was called the New Deal, and in many ways it would mark the very zenith of New York City's influence over American life. And the key to understanding LaGuardia and the successes of his administration, and for that matter, uh, the role of Robert Moses, is to understand the New Deal. For me, the most fascinating thing about the New Deal is that it is in large measure constructed in New York City. That when Franklin Roosevelt goes to Washington, he's not going alone. He is going with a set of ideas and experiences which he has gleaned by working in New York City and New York State politics for the previous decades, and he is going with a platoon of New Yorkers from various aspects of New York life who also have got programs, who have got ideas, which have been tested and worked out on the streets of New York City. In essence, I would argue that what happens 
in uh, 32 and 33 is that New York invades Washington. New York boards and seizes Washington. But instead of treating it as a conquered country, what they do is say, Washington has got to do what New York City has been doing for all these years and do it on a colossal new scale with the resources that only the federal state can command. It must intervene in the workings of the economy. It must not, in fact, just sit back and be laissez-faire in its attitude. It must seize the moment and operate on a very different set of parameters than the previous administration. When you look at the New Deal, there are a lot of people from around the country who are players, but who's sitting at Roosevelt's right hand? It's Harry Hopkins, who comes up through the social work and the welfare bureaucracy uh, in New York City and is the guy who's sitting there and you know, starts signing zillions of dollars worth of checks. On his left hand uh, is Eleanor, who is in fact plugged into the settlement house movement and a whole network of uh, labor reformers. There's Frances Perkins, who's going to be his uh, Secretary of Labor. She was back in the Triangle Fire days. She's, in fact, continuing and applying lessons that were learned in uh, that period on a national level. The list just goes on and on and on. There's this squadron of New Yorkers who are installed in high places and begin to promote uh, New York City uh, programs. The seismic changes wrought by the New Deal would reverberate for the rest of the century, as billions of dollars in federal aid were soon pouring out of Washington, affecting every aspect of American life. There were funds for unemployment relief, for long-term initiatives in health and social security, for public housing and labor reform. And most surprisingly of all, in the darkest hour of the Depression, for the kind of large-scale public works that Fiorello LaGuardia had made the centerpiece of his vision of a transformed metropolis. For better or worse, it completely transformed the way people view government and government's role in people's lives. Before the New Deal, it didn't occur to most people that government had any obligation to its citizenry beyond the basics of military support and security and things like that. But the idea that government had a responsibility to intervene economically, to provide employment when necessary, to keep people from starving even. This was simply not understood. Uh, Social Security, something that's now sacrosanct in, in many ways, was a novel idea that, that people should actually enjoy security and that government was obliged to provide it. It changes the nature of the relationship between citizens and government. And yet, the tremendous irony is, is that while in the short term, the New Deal programs are going to be the salvation of New York City, because Washington comes out of this enormously strengthened, New York, which had been the unofficial capital and the financial capital and the cultural capital and the marketing capital, has now got a rival in a major league way that it had never had before. Uh, and suddenly, you know, it's not the center of the country, it's just another city and a very hard-pressed city and it's dependent upon federal transfer. And Washington is going to apply the same New Deal tactics and strategies out west, where they're going to build huge public works projects, you know, dams, electrification systems, water supply, which is very largely going to be drawing upon money garnered from the Northeast and New York in particular, to develop what's going to emerge a little bit down the road as a sunbelt competitor to New York City's economic primacy. And it's going to do the same thing in the South. The New Deal, courtesy very largely of New Yorkers, is in fact going to equalize the relations between the regions. But it is going to transform forevermore New York City's centrality uh, that was characteristic of it up till uh, uh, that period. The full effects of that epic transformation would not be felt for decades to come. In the meantime, no mayor in the country saw more clearly the potential of the New Deal than Fiorello LaGuardia. Pioneering the use of the airplane in government, the indefatigable mayor, who liked to be addressed by his old Army Air Corps rank of major, was soon flying down to Washington early in the morning, returning to New York by late afternoon with the promise of new federal aid in hand. Thanks to his immense personal charm, his reputation for incorruptibility, and his close personal ties to Franklin Roosevelt. 
Our mayor is the most appealing man I know. He comes to Washington and tells me a sad story. The tears run down my cheeks, and the tears run down his cheeks. And the first thing I know, he has wangled another $50 million out of me. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Fiorello LaGuardia is, you know, like this with Franklin Roosevelt. That's the critical connection. And money, billions of dollars, flow into a vast series of public works programs that build things that are socially useful. They build highways, they build airports, they build hospitals, they build schools, they build colleges, they build, you know, health centers. A vast panoply of expansion of things. Before it was over, the unlikely alliance between the patrician president and the diminutive populist mayor, whom one man called a lowercase Franklin Roosevelt, would turn New York into a showcase for the New Deal. In the darkest hours of the Depression, Fiorello LaGuardia would have the resources he would need to turn New York into what he called a gigantic laboratory of civic reconstruction. All he needed was someone who knew how to use them. And within days of his inauguration, on January 1st, 1934, he had turned to a man already universally known in New York as the man who could get things done. His name was Robert Moses, the greatest builder of public works the city would ever see. And long after he had left the public stage, people would still be debating the meaning and consequences of his extraordinary career. Robert Moses was the single most important figure to emerge in New York City in the 20th century. He was a unique figure. Not only is there no counterpart in New York City to Robert Moses, neither is there any counterpart to Robert Moses in Chicago or Los Angeles or Houston. One person who single-handedly, over a period of almost half a century, reshapes a great metropolis. In a democracy, you think of power in four-year terms, or eight years, or 12-year spans. Robert Moses held power for almost half a century. And with this power, he shaped New York, not for a term or not for a decade and not for a generation, but for almost half a century. When you talk about New York in the 20th century, the story of New York is inseparable from the story of Robert Moses. To an astonishing extent, they are one and the same. What Robert Moses did that had to be done was to adapt really a 19th century city uh, for 20th century circumstances. He was swimming with the tide of history. The American people had essentially voted with their pocketbooks and with their minds in favor of a more spread out environment, one that was based really on automobile transportation. Robert Moses took that idea and ran with it like no one else in American history. Of course, there are great historical forces which make things the way they are, and to an extent, every individual is subject to them. But there are some individuals who ride the crest of the social forces and turn them in their direction. Moses was that kind of a person because of his personality, the scope of his vision, his energy, and he had an intensity of purpose, I mean, a savage will that he's gonna get this done, you know. His saying that I hit him with a meat ax, and the meat ax could be anything he had to do to get his end accomplished. He certainly did some terrible things and tried to do some terrible things that he fortunately did not get away with. And I think the key to understanding Robert Moses is that he didn't care about people. He passionately cared about automobiles and moving them. Sophocles said, one must wait until the evening to see how splendid the day has been. When you look at what Moses wrought, you say these are some of the greatest creations of man. But what did they create? What kind of a city did he leave behind?
He had begun his career, one man later said, as the very flower of New York's reform movement. The fiercely driven second son of wealthy German Jews, fired by the ideals of the progressive age and the dream of public service. Coming of age as the era of horse and rail gave way to the era of the motor car. From beginning to end, the story of his life would be bound up with the automobile and its fateful impact on the life of American cities. At the turn of the century, what at first appeared to be a harmless little toy began puttering around on the streets of the sea. And it wasn't a harmless little toy. It was, in fact, the agent of dissolution which was about, over the next 20, 30 years, to unravel and to decentralize this tremendously integrated rail-based system that had been constructed. Nobody took it seriously at first because, in fact, it was a toy, and it was a rich man's toy. No great surprise, these early machines were expensive, and you had to have a chauffeur, and they were very fragile, so you needed an indoor garage. Uh, so it's not a surprise that of the, around 1900, the 8,000 cars that existed in the U.S., the clear majority of them were owned in New York City, and they were owned in, in gross lots. John Jacob uh, Astor had 32. One summer day in 1901, two-year-old Louis Camille was playing out in Lower East Side Street, son of Italian immigrant parents, and he was run over by an automobile driven by a chauffeur who was taking two Wall Street businessmen down to their office. A huge crowd formed up and nearly, in fact, lynched all of the occupants of the car. This was the first critical clash. The streets were playgrounds for the working class poor, and the car is making a competing claim for rights of access to this place, and uh, it makes it with brute force. Henry Ford changes the equation. By mass-producing autos, he's churning out the Model T. Flivers are dropping in price. They're within access range now, but much larger middle class. They're no longer exclusively toys for the rich. The number of car ownership begins to soar throughout the country, but in New York City in particular. They triple between 1915 and 1920. But it's nothing compared to what happens in the 20s. The 20s, in fact, is when the automobile explodes. It's not just the spectacular presence of these things in terms of the sheer number of people who are now driving them. It is the way the cities begin to be remade to suit the needs and convenience of automobilers. Convinced that the future of American life lay with the automobile, Robert Moses was among the first to sense that cities themselves would have to be dramatically rebuilt to accommodate the reality of the motor car. Appointed by Governor Al Smith in the boom years of the 1920s to reorganize New York state government, he soon began to conceive of a revolutionary project of his own. A sweeping network of limited access roadways, the first of their kind in the world, leading out to a vast system of public parks and beaches that would open the hinterlands of Long Island to millions of New Yorkers starved for open spaces and begin to fulfill the promise of the automotive age. Nothing on a scale like this had ever been conceived of. He wanted people to drive to beauty, to a park, through a park. He called them ribbon parks. And every aspect of them was going to be beautiful. On April 18th, 1924, Smith put Moses in charge of what was now officially called the Long Island State Park Commission. After decades of dreaming, he would finally get a chance to build. And build he did, with a single-minded drive and ferocity that stunned everyone who came in contact with him. Riding roughshod over long entrenched interests, bullying private landowners and millionaires, and when necessary, swaying local political bosses by offering inside information on the layout of his proposed roadways. You could say that the city was part of a larger continuity, that it was part of a flow, and cars became a central metaphor for him in the flow of traffic as opening up a new possibility for cities. Maybe you could see him saying that cities and citizens of them didn't have to be stuck, that he would have seen the block, the street, the neighborhood as obstacles. And he felt that now you can overcome these obstacles. You can get into the flow. And, uh, you know, he, he built the flow. He created the flow. And he had great skill 
at putting this across to the public. Wouldn't you like to go with the flow? Wouldn't you like to flow? Isn't it better than just hanging out? It took Moses six or seven years of fighting with Al Smith behind him to hack out that park and parkway system for Long Island. But when he did it, when Jones Beach opened in 1929, the whole world came to praise it. No one had ever seen anything like it. And who came? The young urban builders, the people who wanted to build roads, who wanted to build parkways, who wanted to build state parks. They came to Robert Moses to learn how to do it. So he was not only America's greatest road builder, but he was the man who taught the other road builders. By 1929, Robert Moses had helped set in motion one of the most fateful transformations the city and its surroundings would ever undergo, opening the region beyond the city's borders to the reality of the automobile. Now, as the private energies of the 1920s gave way to the public crisis of the 1930s, he would finally get a chance to transform the city itself, which, for better or for worse, would never be the same again. Up through the Depression, the federal government had almost no involvement in funding urban functions. They just didn't pay for things that happened in cities. But the New Deal changes all that, and uh, they begin a whole new phase in American history in which the federal government funds local enterprises. Because one main reason for doing this is to get the economy going, get cash flowing, uh, the Roosevelt administration is very eager for things they can start quickly. And one of the geniuses of Robert Moses is that he understood that opportunities would arise. And he had plans in his back pocket, sometimes just in the back of his head, but sometimes more than that, that can be pulled out of the drawer and put in place extremely quickly. From the day he took office as New York City Parks Commissioner on January 19th, 1934, Robert Moses would become the epicenter of a whirlwind of public building, reaching out to every corner of the city. He had accepted the job only on certain conditions, that he be given absolute control over every park in the city, that he retain the state post Al Smith had given him, and that he be granted still larger powers as head of the moribund Triborough Bridge Authority, an immense public works project that had languished so long, people had started calling it the bridge to nowhere. Eager to begin rebuilding the battered city, LaGuardia agreed, and in the end, Moses himself drafted the special legislation creating his new position. Then, within hours of taking office, swiftly fired all the old borough commissioners and their staff and set to work. The parks were in complete disrepair. The Central Park Zoo, Tammany, of course, had let it go completely without repair. So the cages were so rotten that they were afraid that the lions and tigers might break out. But instead of repairing the cages, they hired Tammany men to sit at the entrances of the, of the zoo with shotguns to shoot the animals in case there was a fire or the cages broke. Armed with New Deal funds, Moses exploded into action, turning first to the city's dilapidated parks. Within days, he had sent for the crack team of men he had used on Long Island, then hired more than 600 unemployed architects and engineers along with a team of hard-driving Irish foremen who quickly whipped an army of newly recruited relief workers into a disciplined construction force, 80,000 strong. All through the winter of 1934, triple shifts of workers labored round the clock to meet the master builder's punishing timetable. By the first warm weekend in May, Moses' workforce had completely transformed every public park and green space in the city more than 1,700 renovation projects in all, including Central Park itself, where, before the year was out, a magnificent new zoo had arisen on the crumbling ruins of the old. Ladies and gentlemen, children, you will find there another of the actual living proof that New York City is getting something out of its relief expenditures. We seek to put them to useful work, and hardly a week passes 
but in the park department there is completed one of these work projects. As signs of life began to stir in the city for the first time in half a decade, hope began to rise in the hearts of New Yorkers. And it was only the beginning. In little more than half a decade, boldly stretching the definition of parks to include limited access parkways and wresting money from any source he could, Robert Moses would begin to construct the first urban highway system in the world, connected to a breathtaking network of tunnels viaducts, causeways, and bridges that would begin to adapt the old city grid to the reality of the automobile and knit the entire region into a single coherent whole. The 30s, of course, is all about concrete. Really, it's the 30s that finishes off mass transit as a possible contender for future uh, transport-based operations in the city. You know, what the auto industry was able to do was to get public money pouring into constructing the infrastructure that they wanted. Then with WPA money, in fact, they rip up miles and miles of, of streetcars in city after city around the country, run them into the ground, shut them down. It is true that LaGuardia does maintain the subway system. He picks up the bankrupt IRT. He does push for new lines. But above ground, LaGuardia is a car man. LaGuardia believes that this is modern, this is cutting edge, this is the wave of the future. So what Moses is doing is the executor of this program. The federal government, New Deal money, just cascades into the city. And very much in the Olmsted tradition, he's gonna build a series of connecting highways. Before the decade was out, a great circumferential parkway had begun to sweep around Brooklyn from the East River to the Atlantic. A ravishing bridge had leapt over the Harlem River, connecting Manhattan and the Bronx. And the revolutionary West Side Improvement, a gorgeously landscaped six and a half mile long urban symphony, Park Park and Park Parkway, had begun to sweep majestically down the west side of Manhattan along the Hudson River. Covering over the old New York Central tracks and transforming Riverside Park from an urban wasteland into a piece of urban poetry. The seductively curving drive gave motorists an experience of the city they had never had before. The ravishing towers of midtown Manhattan looming above the lush greenness of the park in a shimmering landscape that, as in a movie or a dream, was constantly shifting, constantly changing, and always in motion. No one has ever been able to know how much money Robert Moses spent on the West Side Improvement. I finally concluded that the amount that he spent was at least $180 million, but it was almost certainly well over $200 million, a quarter of a billion dollars on a public work in 1930s America. And you know, the chorus of praise for this highway was just fantastic. And one editorial said, the railroad tracks are covered at last. And yet, in scale and audacity, even the West Side improvement paled before that of another giant public work. The Triborough Bridge, an epic complex of roadways and bridges that lay at the very heart of Robert Moses' new transportation system. And there it is very clear what we mean by Robert Moses as the shaper of New York. The glaciers that had rumbled down from Hudson Bay eons before had torn Long Island, which carries, of course, Brooklyn and Queens, loose from the mainland of the United States. Robert Moses stitched it back together again with the Triborough Bridge. If you look at New York from the air, you see an incredible fact that three great boroughs of the city, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Queens, rush together. The streets appear to be rushing together. And all of a sudden, at the point that they're rushing together, they're held apart by these narrow bands of water in the middle of which is Randall's and Ward's Island. By building Triborough and uniting these three boroughs, he was uniting the city. He was repairing single-handedly what nature had done. Despite its name, Triborough was not really a bridge at all, but three giant bridges in one. A rendezvous of bridges, one man later said, 
together with 13,500 feet of elevated viaduct and 14 miles of roadway, a traffic machine, another man said, the largest ever built. Mighty Triborough. This is just one part of it. It's the largest vertical lift bridge in the world, which means that that center span you're looking at has to rise 80 feet in the air vertically between the two towers every time a large ship passes. If you were standing here in 1934 and 35, when they were putting in the girders for this span, each girder was as big as a 10-room ranch house. And it was so big that one barge or two barges couldn't carry it. Four or five barges would be lashed together and they'd come up this river pushed by a whole covey of tugboats until they got it into position. Remember, this was in the middle of the Depression. There was so much concrete in this bridge that they had to reopen cement factories from Maine to Mississippi. To make the wood for the forms to hold the concrete, a whole forest had to be cut down in Oregon. 5,000 men at a time were working on these islands on the bridge, and of course the 5,000 men were only putting into place the materials that had been created, the steel, etc., by many times 5,000 men. 31 million man hours of work went into the Triborough Bridge in 134 cities in 20 states. In the middle of the Depression, this one project really galvanized things across the United States. The Triborough Bridge, with its Art Deco detailing, with its cloverleaf arrangements of ramps connecting not only the three boroughs, but the uh, parks, which he reclaimed on the islands below, is an unbelievably complicated and beautiful piece of engineering. It's highway building lifted to the art of sculpture in motion. Uh, it's fantastic. Under his direction, we got some of the greatest public works the world has ever seen. The massive structure was finally opened on July 11, 1936, in an awe-inspiring ceremony broadcast by radio across the entire nation. It was, one government official said simply, one of the greatest accomplishments of man. President Roosevelt himself gave the keynote address but it was Robert Moses who was the undisputed hero of the day. We are definitely in an era of building, the best kind of building, the building of great public projects for the benefit of the public and with the object of building human happiness. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Year after year, as one immense public works project after another rose in New York City, the frenzy of construction became a heart-stopping symbol of civic rebirth and renewal. Holding out the promise, one man later said, of a glorious future, just over the horizon, not merely for the privileged few, but for the people as a whole. Robert Moses himself was certain he held the keys to the city's future. There are people who like things as they are, he declared. I can't hold out any hope to them. They have to keep moving further away. This is a great big state, and there are also other states. Let them go to the Rockies. Well, he's absolutely the right man at the right moment, and there's no question about it. He has his own vision for what New York could be and what cities can be, and suddenly he has an opportunity to put that into practice. He's got manpower through the WPA, he's got money, he's got a city that is devastated and needs an infrastructure, and he's tremendously creative and smart and gifted, and he really has a vision that he really tries to implement. Sometimes that came at the expense of other things. Sometimes it came with a vision uh, that we no longer have. He built highways right on the river because in his day you drove for recreation and that's what you saw. Now we have highways blocking our views of the river. But at the time, it was a vision about how to integrate the landscape and make it work for human beings that transformed the city and people's lives in it. In retrospect, however, the opening of the Triborough Bridge would seem to some to mark a fateful turning point in the culture of the automobile in New York and in the career of Robert Moses in ways New Yorkers themselves did not fully comprehend at the time. 
and with consequences that would not be fully felt for decades. Robert Moses is the paradox of urban history in the 20th century. Every city in the United States wanted a Robert Moses. Every city wanted a Bob Moses building bigger roads, faster expressways, and more of them. And Moses was extraordinarily good at actually shaping the physical city and getting things done. I think the damage that Moses did is actually very real, so that the other side of the coin is Bob Moses is actually an embodiment of the fact that in the 20th century, we put the physical prominence of the city before its people. We actually fetished the urban form and forgot the human beings who lived there. Less than five weeks after the opening of the Triborough Bridge, built to decrease congestion in the city, New Yorkers got a glimpse of the future the automobile was beginning to usher in. When, on August 17, 1936, the biggest traffic jam in the history of the metropolitan region brought cars on the Long Island parkways to a standstill. You know, the lesson of New York, I mean, if you look at Moses' career, when it turns dark, he refused to take into account the effects, what we call today traffic generation, of his facilities, the fact that by building a road, by building a bridge, by building a tunnel, you are in itself increasing traffic. So whatever benefit you're expecting to get is going to be immediately reduced. For example, when he said the Triborough Bridge will solve the traffic problem on the East River Bridges, the Queensboro, etc. He opened the Triborough Bridge, the traffic was far heavier than he predicted, Triborough was crowded, and so was the Queensboro Bridge. So he said, I'll solve that by building the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. For a while it worked. In two years, the Queensboro was as full as it had ever been, and more. Triborough was more full than ever before, and the Bronx Whitestone Bridge was full. So he said, well, I'll build the Throgs Neck Bridge. You know, if Moses had had his way, he would have built bridges the length of Long Island Sound, not only polluting the sound, changing the, the, the flow of the water and all, but with each bridge, he just would have generated more traffic. In the 1960s or so, some of Moses' critics understood that when you build highways, um, you create more congestion and more pressure for highways. Moses understood this much earlier. I mean, when he was trying to get money for highways, he would say it's to relieve congestion, but he knew that in fact it would create more congestion and a need for further highways. And hence would have to move the flow, would have to move the map to create more flow and make it flow further on and further out. In that sense, the, once you started the highway machine, it was self-perpetuating. You couldn't stop. Even more troubling than the immense traffic jams his public works were generating. Though far less apparent to the naked eye was the power Moses was accumulating in the process of building them through the instrument of the new public authorities. You know, we are taught in political science classes that in a democracy, power comes from being elected. It's the will of the people. Robert Moses realized that he was never going to get power through that normal democratic process. He had to figure out a different way to get it. And he did it by creating what is really a fourth branch of government and one not responsible to the will of the people, insulated from the will of the people, the public authority. Empowered to sell bonds to create great public works, Public authorities like Triborough were meant to go out of business once the tolls they charged had paid for the structures they created. But Robert Moses had no intention of ever closing his authorities down. Rewriting the legislation under which authorities were chartered, he made sure that the millions of dollars in nickels and dimes that streamed in every year remained a continuous flow of revenue upon which he could borrow still more for future projects. A bedrock of power that would place him beyond reach of the mayor, the governor, or the people themselves in perpetuity. The centerpiece of all his power was what he called Triborough, mighty Triborough, and that's where the headquarters were on Randall's Island, in a little building underneath that toll plaza. Every driver who crossed this island, who crossed this bridge, had to pay a toll in coin. And of course, almost none of the millions of motorists who passed over had any idea that the headquarters were down there. Now, the money that came in 
through the tolls was spent at his sole discretion. He didn't have to do, as mayors do, go to a board of estimate or, or submit his will to the voters. He could spend authorities' money as he wanted to spend authorities' money. So he created a system in which the voice of the people hardly mattered at all. And I think he was able to do it in part because he was making so many people rich and they were there for him and he didn't have to pick up the phone. So construction companies, bond underwriters, you know, insurance men on every level, lawyers. I mean, they were just phalanxes and phalanxes of people. And, you know, and the wheels within wheels, we still don't really understand. As the Depression wore on, Robert Moses would create more than a dozen public authorities, integrating them into an immense self-perpetuating machine for building public works. A system increasingly remote from the public in whose name they had been created, an irony not lost on some of Moses' closest admirers. Frances Perkins, who was Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor, put it very well. She was reacting to Moses having a tantrum about the people in Jones Beach, that they threw litter on the beach and didn't clean up. Moses said, I'll get them, I'll fix them. And Perkins said, he loves the public, but he hates people. And I think that probably describes a lot of other public officials, too, including many who've done wonderful things. But I think with Moses, the hatred of people eventually began to trip him up. By 1936, tensions had begun to rise between the city's highest elected official and the hard-driving bureaucrat who was his parks commissioner. Though they worked well together and shared many of the same goals, it was becoming increasingly obvious that Fiorello LaGuardia and Robert Moses embodied radically different values and attitudes towards the city and its people. One of the things about LaGuardia is that he really, he appreciated ethnicity. He was hip to ethnic neighborhoods. He was always going up to neighborhoods, going into all the stores, talking to people in their various languages. And, you know, he would go and talk to Ukrainians in Ukrainian, you know, and they would love him for life. And, and you know, who knows how many words he knew in Ukrainian, but he could do that, and he loved doing that. You know, and he loved being sort of on the ground. He loved being on the street. Moses, on the other hand, went out of his way to highlight his distance from those people, his contempt for them, and his sense that he was dedicated to a larger system, to seeing New York as part of a flow chart, you know, as part of a flow that went all through the country, in which streets, neighborhoods, sense of place, ethnic loyalties meant nothing. The only thing that really mattered was the flow. Infuriated by his inability to rein Robert Moses in, Fiorello LaGuardia raged constantly behind his back, complaining that no law, no regulation, no budget stops Robert Moses from his appointed task. Moses, for his part, who routinely referred to the mayor as that little organ grinder and that Dago son of a bitch, chafed at the necessity of having to ask for money every time he wanted to build. To some degree, LaGuardia did control Moses, and you see it in housing, because Moses wanted to take over public housing. Moses tried to steal the housing money and the housing authority from LaGuardia by mobilizing the real estate forces of the city behind him, but LaGuardia stops him. He was, in his own way, just as tough as Robert Moses. And what he basically did was is Moses is making this radio speech to mobilize public support over the municipal radio station. LaGuardia actually has the engineers cut the station off the air. So LaGuardia kept Moses out of housing. In the end, however, even LaGuardia himself failed to grasp the sheer scale of the forces overtaking New York during the New Deal. Or how much the future of the city lay not with the street and the block and the neighborhoods he loved, but with the car and the highway, and with men like Robert Moses. By the mid-1930s, Fiorello LaGuardia and Robert Moses had succeeded in turning New York into the gigantic laboratory of civic reconstruction LaGuardia had dreamed of. But all the new building could not disguise the fact 
that across the city, terrible suffering and hardship remained. Nowhere was the suffering worse than on the densely crowded streets and avenues of Harlem, where, little more than a year after LaGuardia took office, three decades of relative racial calm in New York came to a tragic, violent end. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Blanks and Hughes. More than anywhere else in the city, Harlem, the proud black capital that had arisen so spectacularly only two decades before, had been all but devastated by the Depression. The Renaissance of the 1920s had been a cultural triumph, not an economic one. And long before the crash itself, the district's fragile prosperity had begun to disintegrate. It became a slum. Uh, it had been a ghetto before. It becomes a real slum afterwards. After the Depression, rents, evictions, unemployment, tuberculosis, all the indicia of decay and dysfunction accelerate so that Harlem becomes a place in which the, the opportunities that uh, had brought it into being really become almost exceptional. I think the major difference is that in the 1920s, Harlem really did believe in mobility. And most people believe that concepts of American mobility applied to Harlem. You had a population of people who were already depending upon rather menial jobs to sustain themselves. The hope was that with regular employment and with the, with the other opportunities that cities provided, education, better housing, better living conditions, better health care, um, there would be mobility. By the 1930s, all of that gets challenged. First of all, that category that was referred to as Negro jobs disappears because white New Yorkers desperate for work begin to demand positions that they formerly refused to take. It's a truism, but it's true that the Depression was far worse in Harlem than anywhere else. The levels of unemployment are simply spectacular. And remember, there had already been discrimination, even in good times. I mean, the hospitals would not hire blacks. The drugstores would not hire blacks. The insurance companies, even though they wrote, you know, thousands of policies, uh, low-cost policies to Harlem residents, they wouldn't hire blacks. And even when the Depression starts and there are relief programs in place, uh, the WPA discriminates as well. In the 1930s, Robert Moses built 255 new playgrounds in New York City. He built two in areas that black children could use. You know, white children were given sliding boards and swings and beautiful little wading pools in the playgrounds. Black children could still play with their broomsticks in the streets if they wanted to play baseball. Still had a splash through the fire hydrants. People know if a city cares for them or not. A playground is a lot more than a playground. A little vest pocket park is a, little, a lot more than a little bit of green. It's a sign that the city cares, that it's willing to devote something to your neighborhood. What did the mothers of Harlem think of the policies of the state when there was no place for their children to play? Even more insidious for the city's black population in the end were the federal mortgage and loan programs promulgated by the New Deal, which, to revive the moribund housing market in the outer boroughs, set in motion a fateful process that in the next two decades would systematically segregate neighborhood after neighborhood in New York by race. African-American ghettoization really begins in the third decade of the 20th century. It begins in the 1930s. It begins with New Deal policy. It begins with the federal government and the state government 
colluding with banks and insurance companies to solve New Deal problems by building, 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 building. We're building housing at the periphery of the city at an incredible pace. And in order to create a market for that housing, you've got to force white, working class and middle class families to move. And in order to get them out there, what we do is actually make it irrational to stay inside the city. During the early years of the New Deal, the federal government established the Homeowners Loan Corporation. And the Homeowners Loan Corporation actually went out in Brooklyn. And they began mapping out the borough into 66 neighborhoods, going block by block and finding every black, Latino, Irish, Jewish, Italian, Polish family that was there, and assigning ratings to each neighborhood based on the racial and ethnic makeup. Then they distributed the maps to banks and held banks to a certain standard when loaning money for homes and rental. The consequences of having your ratings go down is, of course, that your housing property goes down. So for instance, white Brooklynites living in the old sections of North Brooklyn all of a sudden find out that their housing is less valuable, not because they've done anything and not because their neighborhood has changed, but because banks won't lend anyone money to move there unless those people are black. After the Homeowners Loan Corporation begins segregating on the federal level and working with local banks in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx, and Queens, the state gets involved in redlining. They also map out Brooklyn. They go block by block. And this time they look for only black and Latino persons. And a single black person living on a block is enough to redline a block. The effect will be, in fact, to do extraordinary damage to black communities throughout New York. All of a sudden, black communities that had been scattered throughout New York City, which had long traditions in certain neighborhoods in the southern part of New York, um, throughout Brooklyn and Queens, and even on Staten Island, were being physically segregated, rooted up. When the Homeowners Loan Corporation finishes its work in the 1940s, it has dramatically altered the makeup of Brooklyn. In 1930, when the Depression starts, black Brooklynites are actually the least segregated group physically in the borough. By 1950, they're the most segregated group. The segregation is all in central Brooklyn in the Bedford-Stuyvesant district, and that will become the largest black ghetto in the United States by the end of the 1960s. In the 1930s, Harlem goes from being an ethnic community with quite a bit of mobility and optimism to a racial slum with very little optimism, very little hope. The federal government had armed banks and insurance companies and real estate dealers with the public authority to keep black people inside that physical space and to force new black migrants to the city inside similar physical spaces. So as Harlem expands in the 1930s and 1940s, as Bedford-Stuyvesant expands in the 40s and 50s, what remains true about them is black communities no longer control their own destiny by the 50s and 60s. They're being forced and physically quarantined inside the city at a time when white Americans are peculiarly mobile. Why is there a black ghetto in every city in the United States? The answer is public policy, the way we remap cities racially in order to solve economic crises. Year after year, the walls of racial segregation and discrimination closed in around the city's African-American population. To some, the most infuriating bigotry of all was to be found in the heart of Harlem itself where almost none of the dozens of white-owned shops and businesses that lined 125th Street, the commercial spine of the district, was willing to hire African-Americans in any capacity. And church groups and labor groups and socialist groups and black nationalist groups and the Communist Party, among others, begin to set up pickets on 125th Street and other places. They march in front of these stores and say, don't buy where you can't work. And, in fact, this heartens the community. There are some successes, uh, some job openings are, are created, but then, the forces of the law being what they are, the store owners get an injunction passed in 34, and this kind of picketing behavior is, in fact, banned. 
So having gotten themselves together, having come up with a communal collective voice to attempt to redress long-standing racial slash economic grievances, suddenly uh, that voice is cut off. And it's in that context that Harlem explodes. In the winter of 1935, years of rising misery, frustration, and resentment erupted into violence on the streets of Harlem. Around 3.30 on the afternoon of March 19th, a 16-year-old Puerto Rican boy named Lino Rivera was caught stealing a penknife from an S.H. Crest store on 125th Street. A scuffle ensued, and as a crowd of curious onlookers gathered on the sidewalk outside, the shop owner called the police, urging the patrolman when he arrived to avoid further trouble and let the boy go. They actually let Rivera go out a back door and they didn't bother informing anybody. And rumors now shot through the street that he'd been killed. And, and, and in fact, uh, crowds begin uh, to form. By the evening, people are arriving with placards and pickets. And eventually, somebody hurls rock through the plate glass window and Harlem explodes. And people pour out of the tenements into the streets. And they not only attack and loot uh, this particular store, but up and down 125th Street and, and other areas, except for stores that hastily tack up placards in their front window, black owned business, you know, or if it's a white store, we hire black people. And in fact, they were, relatively speaking, spared. There are also tangles with the police. You have to understand, it's a virtually entirely white police force. It is seen as an army of occupation sitting on the discontent that's been building. All through the night and on into the next day, the riot went on. By the time order was restored, 125 people had been arrested, over 100 had been injured, and three killed, all of them black. This is the first black explosion. Up till this point, when you talk race riots, you're talking about whites pouring into a black neighborhood, stomping on black people, the draft riots of 1863. Nobody for 20 years has been dreaming of invading black Harlem. It's a huge stronghold, but now you've got a whole new phenomenon. I think one of the major things that the riot does is it actually forces us to seriously look at the condition of black Americans in major cities. New York becomes sort of a harbinger for what's going to happen other places. And you've got to take New York City seriously, especially Harlem. It's sitting right in Manhattan. It's in the cultural and economic capital of the United States. And what happens there is actually more important than what happens other places. It does get attention. It does force the administration to seriously look at the plight of black Americans. But still, the response is actually rather weak. The repercussions of the riots would continue for months and years to come. At the insistence of black leaders, LaGuardia appointed a special commission to examine the social and economic conditions in Harlem whose report painted a bleak portrait of the city's racial divisions and inequalities. But like most white politicians of his day, the mayor, whom the black-owned Amsterdam News had praised in 1931 as one of the most fearless friends the Negro has ever had, in or out of Congress, was still not prepared to put racial equality at the center of his reform agenda. Speaking before a group of church leaders, he had, he said, no illusion about the difficulties facing your people in New York. But reconciling the disparities caused by American racism, he said, was a task beyond his abilities. I think LaGuardia is a difficult person to describe, especially his stance on race. He endears himself to many African Americans by standing up for people um, by standing up for black congressmen, Oscar de Priest and other folks who had been tossed out of Congress, by demanding, in fact, that they be given equal treatment. On the other hand, when it came to real substantive changes that would affect African Americans in a positive way, LaGuardia tended to, in fact, do what most mayors of New York City have done, and that is side with separate and less equal, because the ethnic algebra of the city allows you to overserve some people and underserve others, and it's a very good formula for getting elected. The question of what will happen to the Negro in New York is overlaid with shadows of tragic premonition. The first race riot in New York was in 1712. The most recent was in 1935. The last 
is not yet come. Fortune magazine. Bit by bit, the New York of 1920 has rearranged and expanded itself. New highways sweep beneath its bold escarpments. New housing and new playgrounds have been carved from its native rock. Giant new bridges soar above its two rivers, and new tubes have burrowed beneath the waters. For perhaps the first time in its ruthless, headlong history, some new impulse, something apart from commerce, has been acting on the town. Some sense of community design and purpose has tempered the obsession with buying and selling. Out of the old demonic energy has come a new ambition to build a city more fit for human use and aspiration. Claire Price. On November 2nd, 1937, Fiorello LaGuardia pulled off the simple feat that had eluded every reform mayor before him. He was re-elected. The largest majority in the city's history swept him back into office, along with a host of reform candidates, including the president of every borough except the Bronx. LaGuardia himself took the landslide as a ringing endorsement of his policies and a mandate to lead New York into a still brighter future. We're going to make the city a real heaven, he said. But what was passed down to me by my mother, my father, by people in the neighborhood uh, uh, was his absolute exuberant optimism. We're going to get through this. There's a depression to hell with it. We'll go. The mob has everything fixed to hell with it. They'll throw their slap machines in the river. Uh, you don't like this? To hell with it. Let's go do it anyway. It's the depression. You can't build an airport. This is New York. You got to have an airport. In 1934, LaGuardia takes a flight from Chicago to New York, says on his ticket, and as usual, the airplane lands in Newark Airport, and he refuses to get out. My ticket says New York. This is not New York, this is New Jersey. And after everybody else gets off, the airplane takes off with only LaGuardia in it and lands at Floyd Bennett Field. And from the first day that he's mayor, he is pushing for the construction of what is going to be uh, LaGuardia Airport. And again, it is the New Deal money that makes this possible. The biggest program that the WPA undertook anywhere in the country was the construction of LaGuardia Airport. And he is out there every day. He is, you know, hands-on. He is watching the construction of this thing because he understands that this is the next link, you know, that the city has always thrived on linkages, on connectivity. There has been the Black Ball Line, you know, connection, the Erie Canal Line connection, and the Atlantic Cable connection, and the steamboat and the steamer connection. This is the 20th century's great linkage to be made, and he seizes it. But for all the accomplishments of LaGuardia's first term, no one was more aware than LaGuardia himself how much remained to be done. And five years into his tenure in City Hall, he continued to drive himself at a pace that amazed and increasingly worried his closest associates. Of them all, None was closer than Charles C. Burlingham, a legendary 81-year-old lawyer and civic reformer, widely known as New York's first citizen. The distinguished barrister was as proud as anyone in the city of the progress LaGuardia had made in turning New York into what the mayor himself called the world's greatest experiment in social and political democracy. But he had come to fear for the health and well-being of the driven little mayor who had come to identify himself so completely with the people of New York City. You're a very tired man and must get some rest, Burlingham wrote in a confidential letter to the mayor. When I drive through the vast reaches of the Bronx and see the swarming myriads, I say to myself, can it be that one man is responsible for the welfare of these people? The world is in chaos, struggling to master its own inventions. 
we are in danger of being annihilated by forces which we ourselves set up. The world calls for an answer to this problem of mastering our own inventions. And we propose in 1939 to contribute to that answer. Michael Hare, Secretary of the World's Fair. By the spring of 1939, excitement was building all across New York. For nearly three years, an army of men working under Robert Moses had been laboring to transform a 1,200-acre ash heap far out on the northern edge of Queens into the site of one of the most breathlessly anticipated collective enterprises of the decade. A hymn to progress, forged in the searing crucible of the Great Depression, the monumental fair would, when complete, project the image of a bold new city of tomorrow that in 1939 seemed just around the corner. The 1939 World's Fair was a special moment in time. On the one hand, it was the culmination of almost everything that had transformed in New York in a century and a quarter since the opening of the Erie Canal, the creation of this incredible world metropolis. It was a technological breakthrough, the opportunities for the future. The automobile, what will the future look like? And it was a wonderful General Motors exhibit, for example, and all these kind of gleaming aluminum buildings. Robert Moses, of course, was at the center of this. It was a gigantic World's Fair, bigger, I think, than any World's Fair that had ever taken place up until that point in terms of numbers of people coming through the turnstiles. Incredible event. An exhilarating sense of wonder and a kind of serene ambivalence presided over the New York World's Fair, which, from the day it opened, on April 30th, 1939, touched a deep chord in the consciousness of the American people and proved to be an enormous success. Day after day, week after week, immense crowds streamed through the sleek Art Deco gates and on into the shimmering dreamlike interior of the fair. Drifting through scores of international exhibits and dozens of corporate pavilions, bristling with consumer products and modern devices of all kinds that promised a streamlined chrome-plated future where machines of all kinds delivered ordinary people from the drudgery of housework and physical labor. I think the fair itself has a sublime quality to it because it's the end of American innocence, not just New York innocence. Somehow it's the last time, maybe the 50s was an afterglow, but I think it's the last time we believed we could save the Republic with a dishwasher. Um, that, that vacuuming would somehow transform all American life. If we only had a dishwasher, if we only had a vacuum cleaner, our, our family life would be happy, we would be healthy. If we had a car, it's the last time we really believed that the car was liberating. Because by the end of the Second World War, the car was nothing but a traffic nightmare. Whereas in the 30s, you dreamed of having a car to be able to go out on one of those Robert Moses Parkways out to Jones Beach or someplace like that. In the end, the futuristic city within a city that was the World's Fair was itself a celebration of the great city shimmering on the horizon, and yet in many ways an eerie repudiation of everything it stood for. At the very center of the fair stood the ravishing pure white Trilon and Perisphere, the last and most sublime of New York's great Art Deco icons. Every day, huge crowds thronged into the sphere to gaze in wonder at the immense diorama that had been constructed inside, called Democracy, a radiant vision of the city of tomorrow, wiped clean of the complexity, congestion, and disorder of New York. But the largest crowds by far gathered for the General Motors exhibit, called Futurama, where, once inside, visitors in moving chairs circled a 36,000 square foot model showing the United States as the designers envisioned it, 25 years hence, in the year 1960. They would never forget what they saw there. And what you see there, you sit in your little cushioned two-seater sofas and uh, you roll along, it's an early pre-Disney enterprise, and you go over a scale map of the United States. And what do you see? What is the vision of tomorrow? The vision of tomorrow is 
highways and huge central cities with soaring skyscrapers and little small satellite cities and such. General Motors is in fact, as the New York Times said, selling us the world of tomorrow and the world of tomorrow means that the public has to foot the bill to develop the infrastructure which will make in fact the triumph of the automobile possible. At the very center of the park, General Motors had created an eerie blueprint for New York's destruction and its replacement by a different kind of world entirely. Gone were the crowded streets and neighborhoods, and to a large extent, the streets themselves. In their place, in an inner city eerily empty of human beings, rose tall towers widely separated by broad swaths of green and bisected by highways 14 lanes wide. Those highways carried people out of the city and into an American landscape where people lived mostly in single-family houses, accessible only by car. A landscape built not around the needs of people, but around the needs of automobiles. This is not a vague dream of a life that might be lived in the far future, but one that could be lived tomorrow morning if we willed it so. The relation between these units of stone and steel, highway and green, is a symbol of the new life of tomorrow. That life will be based on a contribution of all elements to a new and living democracy. Robert Korn. But then it took place against the backdrop of the darkness that was coming over the world. 1939, summer of 1939, the World War II had really not started. There was an ominous feeling around the world. Hitler, of course, his soldiers were marching. Uh, Luftwaffe was regarded as uh, this new threatening thing. Uh, there was an unease about things. And so I find what's fascinating about that World's Fair is on the one hand, all the promise of the future, the celebration of the past and how far we have come. We're coming out of the Depression. We're creating this new wonderful space. We're celebrating, in a sense, the achievements of the world. And meanwhile, there's this cloud that we can see in retrospect, but they could see and feel almost themselves at the time, which makes that just such a poignant moment in time. More than 30 million people passed through the gates of the New York World's Fair in the last perfect summer of 1939. Before the first season of the fair was out, however, ominous news came from abroad. On September 1st, 1939, word reached New York that Hitler had invaded Poland. Within days, England and France had declared war on Germany, and the battle for Europe had begun. The fair itself would lumber along uncertainly for a few more months, before closing in the fall of 1940 with barely enough money left over to demolish the exhibits and clear the land. In the end, the 4,000 tons of structural steel that had gone into the Trilon and Perisphere would be donated to the United States military and used to make instruments of war. America itself was still at peace, but it was hard to block out thought, one man said, of what might really be in store for the world of tomorrow. For 18 more months, the United States stayed out of the fighting, but the storm clouds were drawing near. In New York, Robert Moses and Fiorello LaGuardia raced to complete as many public works projects as they could before federal resources were diverted to the war effort. Then, in the dwindling days of 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and the city and country mobilized for war. With civilian needs indefinitely deferred, the New York Housing Authority's blueprints were rolled up and stored away. The unfinished steel and concrete tubes of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel would sit empty beneath the harbor, sealed and forgotten for the duration of the war. In the strange, eventful, and eerily suspended years to come, time itself often seemed to stand still in New York, while beneath it, the forces of change ran faster than ever before. 
visit New York online, jump into a taxi and play a quiz game, visit a virtual New York, and for teachers and parents, take your kids on a learning adventure through your town. PBS Online at pbs.org. America Online Keyword, PBS.